is Michael Gaffinger. I'm one of the full-time volunteers from uh, Imperial Community Church to Sentinel State Prison. Uh, I'm a full-time volunteer chaplain there, and so it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to see you on Sunday morning. Generally, you don't see me because I'm out there conducting services. And um, I'm there about six days a week, uh, anywhere from 32 to uh, 50 plus hours, uh, ministering to the men and uh, uh, to the, the inmates and the officers alike. And uh, so I, I greatly uh, appreciate your prayers and support, and I know they do as well. In fact, um, our inmates and our officers pray for you also. And uh, incredible work that we see out there. So let's go ahead and take turn to our text this morning, which is in Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, just want to say, you guys are pretty spoiled we are used to, or I should say I'm spoiled, I, I get to uh, enjoy two-hour services. Not two one-hour services, I get two two-hour services, Saturday and Sunday. And we have men who uh, want to be in all four of them, and they spend all day in service with me. So uh, we're going to go for about two hours, and then I release you, right? Is that how it works? <laughs> I'll be done in, on an appropriate time. Well, we're in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, picking up where we left off last time I was here. We looked at Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. Uh, so I'll just pick up in chapter 2. We're going to look at chapter 2, 1 through 10. So we'll go ahead and read together. That'll be our reading of the word, and then we'll open in prayer. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, with, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We've lifted our voices in worship, and now we lift our hands before you, Father, as we kneel before your altar and, and offer up our minds and our hearts before you in worship. Move your Holy Spirit through us to give us ears to hear your word, to give us understanding. May uh, my words be yours. And may your work be done in our hearts as we examine your word, are instructed by them, not for the purpose of knowledge, for information, but for transformation. To the glory of your name forever, in Jesus' name, amen. Splitting Ephesians chapter 2 into two parts, we look at verses 1 through 3. Paul, speaking to the church of, of Ephesus, addresses them, saying, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Speaking to them in past tense, saying, and you were dead. Which is to say that prior to Christ, that is exactly what they were before Christ, and that is dead in trespasses and sin. What is it to trespass and sin, the condition of man? Going beyond the social moral boundaries placed by God, can we say that our society has shown us that? It's easy to point to others, to other nations, to uh, other people, to other cities, to other uh, counties, to other countries. And yet the reality is it's in the hearts of each and every one of us to go beyond the boundaries that God has placed. To uh, call what is evil good and what is good evil. To lay out uh, a manner of life to redefine family, uh, to be whatever it is that suits us in the moment, 
to de- redefine the institutions God has put in place. Uh, to serve ourselves. We do this in social and even our moral boundaries, which God has placed, calling what is uh, calling true what he has called untrue. And sin is this committing that which is contrary to the command and character of God. We can look at the Ten Commandments. I ask them out at the prison regularly. What, uh, uh, why is it wrong to lie? Why is it wrong to steal? Why does God say you shall not lie and you shall not steal? Is it merely a pragmatic statement that is, well, you know, it's, uh, it's not useful to lie? Well, there's, we, we pay people right now to, uh, to run our nation whose job is to lie. Uh, and have made of their lives and their careers lies, and it has served them well. It hasn't served us very well, but it has served them well. Is it merely a pragmatic statement, or is it because of something more? Does God tell us not to lie for any other reason other than that he doesn't lie? You shall not lie. Why? Because I, your creator, I do not lie. It's not part of my character. It's not part of my nature. Why should we not steal? I get a lot of interesting answers out of the prison. And yet the reality is God says, do not steal. Why? God doesn't steal, sure, but also because by stealing we're telling God that his provision is not sufficient for us. And the list goes on. And that's just ten. Prior to Christ outside of Christ, outside of the gospel, outside of the work that God has done, we are all dead in our trespasses and sin before God. And we know that death is final. I've uh, had to experience some funerals recently, and some dear friends of mine have as well. And there is nothing bringing their loved ones back. There is a separation And we are in that condition before God, dead to God. How can the dead know anything of the living? And we are the ones who are dead before God. How can we know what life is if we are dead to the one who, in whom life is found? And it says here, Paul continues on, dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world. The way we once lived the way the world lives, the way man lives in his fallen condition before God, is not that he himself is dead, which he is, but also that society and the world and the direction of the world is also dead to God. Is not, our, is not the world made up of people? And if the people are dead to God, then what is the natural outcome of the nations and societies and institutions that, that uh, those who are separated from God make. They must then also by nature be separated from God as well. And the direction they're going is to be further separated from God. The course of this world. In 1 John 2.17 we're told the world is passing away along with its desires. That is the course of the world is to uh, come to an end. That everything that is not of God will not last. In creation, God makes Adam and Eve. And he makes them in that living uh, relationship with him, innocent to, to evil. He gives them only one law. Do not eat of this tree. The day you eat of it, you will die. Satan comes in and, and questions in just a few Short sentences convinces mankind to look at himself as God to determine what is good and evil. And man makes a very bad decision. Taking the, from, the tr- from the fruit of the tree, disobeying God, sin enters into the world, and by, by sin, death also. And very shortly after, as we turn the pages in Genesis, we go from man and wife in perfect relationship with each other, in perfect relationship with the uh, creation that God has made. Work is good. Relationship is good. 
And even better, man walks with his creator and talks with his creator face to face. And then man, begin, man falls for this temptation to redefine the truth of God for his own truth. And we immediately see a breaking, a shattering in the relationship between a husband and a wife as the wife uh, and the husband begin to blame each other. And the husband turns and says, it's not my fault, it's the wife you gave me. And man then turns not only against, husband and wife not only turn against each other, but they turn against God. That fast. That's how fast death came to Adam and Eve. Immediate. And everything else began to fall apart. You turn the page, you look at the next chapter. The first children. The first family. And into the first family we have the first murder and the first murder victim. And it doesn't get better. The pages continue to turn. And you see self-righteousness, justification for evil, perversion of the marriage relationship, and on and on it goes. Fathers withholding from their sons the truth of who God is. Mankind as a whole turning away from God until God looks at the world and says, the, the, every thought of the hearts of men is desperately wicked all the time. And God finds that all men have turned away. Thank God that he interrupted man's fall. We have the, the account of Noah and God's great mercy and grace towards mankind through Noah. But you look at the world then in, in Noah's day, where Noah is the last man to walk with God in a world that has rejected God in every way. What happened to that world? It went the way the world is supposed to go. It, it was destroyed. Not because of what it did right, but because of what it did wrong, because of the evil in the world. In fact, there was very little right left in the world because man had so fully departed from his God. Death had overtaken Death in, in re relationships. Death in uh, the beautiful uh, relationship God has put in the family of authority and submission of children and parents and the protective relationships of what those um, connections are supposed to look like. Death in every single area. And suffering and sorrow. And God judged the evil of man's heart. Wiping the world clean. Preventing the cancer from being terminal. And yet, what do we see with... We just turn the pages after the flood. God's partial judgment. Arrested sin. But it didn't take very long for man to go right back to it again. Because the world and the people in the world are separated from God because of sin, dead to God. The wisdom of the world, though great in our eyes, does not lead us to God, but away from Him. In Romans chapter 1, we're given a, a look at that consequence of the nature of man. If you want to look there very briefly, in verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It is the sin of men, of mankind, that makes what God has declared true hard to understand, difficult to understand, even impossible to understand. Because a mind separated from God cannot understand God. So if it cannot understand God, how can it possibly understand what is good and evil? It cannot. It can make guesses at best, and they're very poor guesses. 
For what can be known about God if you might think that, well, perhaps God is difficult to know or the truth of God is hard to see? We're told in verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them. And this is the reason why it is plain, even to those who cannot see, which is us as, uh, as fallen men and women, because God has shown it to them. And if God has made something plain, is it plain? Yes. So how come we can't see what was plainly uh, laid before us? Because sin has covered our eyes. You look in Genesis for an example with uh, Abel and Cain. Cain murders. Cain's broken relationship with God makes it impossible for him to understand his own relationship with his brother. His anger towards God is turned against his brother. He puts his brother to death. But he doesn't just put his brother to death. Think of what he also does to his mother and father. He dishonors his mother and father. He goes and takes a wife, very likely one of his sisters. And he, been, he goes and he starts a family of his own. Now he is a father. Does it make any sense that Cain, a man who hates God, would tell and instruct his sons in the way of God as he had been. It makes no sense at all. In fact, he doesn't. And so we have a family now that begins to grow. We have a clan. We have a city that Cain starts. And we come very quickly to a generation where we have a man named Lamech who has taken for himself two wives And he calls upon his father's behavior as a murderer as justice for his own behavior as a murderer. Saying, if Cain is avenged, I am more righteous than my father Cain. I killed a man, my own relative, because he hurt me. self-righteous and self-justifying. Taking into his own hands that which he has no, uh, no authority to take. And it just gets worse. The nature of man and the world dead to God is to become further separated from God. That is what happens when we see with death. Then comes decay. Decay. And decay ravages until we cannot recognize what was once so recognizable. And death to God makes God whom made himself plain to man as death ravages us and we decay. We are so warped we can no longer recognize him in the very plain way he has made himself known. Paul goes on to say, you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. We know he's speaking of Satan. We're told in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Deceiving and lying. So that if by any miracle we might overcome our own uh, blindness and ignorance to God, there is a power far greater than us to whom we are chained who ensures that we should never come to a recognition of the truth. Jesus speaking to religious men. Told, said to them, you are of your father the devil. Your will is to, you, to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. That is the prince of the power of the air. Death is his power 
and to all who listen to him do not receive truth. They receive lies dressed as truth, and the end is death and more death, destruction and more destruction. In our society today, we are ruled over by a plethora, if I can use fancy words, um, of philosophies and doctrines based on the elementary principles of this world. And by that I mean brilliant men who have looked at the world and said, hmm, man has a desire for food and for various satisfaction. Those must be natural. And if they are natural, then they are good. And if they are good, then there is no evil in them. If there's no evil in them, then satisfying them must be a good thing. And yet they've already erred because they have not taken into consideration God who has made man. And if we put to death God, then we must also put to, get, put to death the concept of truth if, because God is truth. We operate in a society right now here in the United States that, does, that is called postmodern and relative. That is to say... And we live by it and we work by it. The, the philosophy that there is, the only truth is that there is no truth. And if there is no truth, then you and me, you and I, we are each the, deter the, the determiners of that which is true for ourselves. And no one has the ability to tell us what is true. We've all heard comments, well, who are you to judge me? Well, that's my truth. Well, that's good for you, but for me it works differently. It's a denial of truth. And the idea of postmodernism is that nothing means anything at all. History means nothing because truth means nothing. It's merely a tool to get people to agree with you. You live, you die, and then worms eat you, as one philosopher, philosopher put it. Dr. William Provine, one of our leading evolutionary biologists, is more of a scientific philosopher than he is actually a scientist. And speaking in debate and extolling the virtues of Darwinian evolution from which we get humanism, that is to the idea that man is basically good and self-perfectible, Provine goes on to say that we know from evolution, we know from the laws that we see around us that there is no God or gods, there is no purposeful forces, there is no ration or reason, there, are, there is no good nor evil, and there is no basis for morality. Your life is meaningless, and that is only, that is all the meaning there is. The full duty of man is to wake up each morning and, to, and like the polywog, to, to see how far he can wiggle before he dies. And when you die, you are dead. Why bother suffering? Why bother doing good? Why bother doing these things? They are unintelligible. You are entirely ruled, he goes on, by your natural desires. And that is the way man ought to be, in his opinion. I'm glad that he was honest about his position. But that ideology runs behind much of what we run off of today. How do we determine truth? By how we feel. How do we determine good and evil? By how we feel about how the other person feels about how we feel. I've watched that conversation take place. One inmate sees another doing something and says, you shouldn't do that. The other one does, feels badly about what he's been told and responds, it, now, the law says you're not supposed to do it. But by making me feel bad about what I do, you have just done wrong to me because I feel bad. And if you feel good about me feeling bad, then you are bad because you should feel bad about me feeling bad. And then you should feel good that you felt bad about me feeling bad. What is that? It's crazy. But we watch in our news, we watch in our society how we determine what is right and wrong, good and evil. It's all based off of feeling, not off of fact. Because we are 
being bombarded daily by philosophies from a world separated from God. And Satan is opposing the truth claims of God with lies, just as he did in the garden. God says, the day you eat of this, you shall surely die. And what does Satan oppose that with? Did God really say? And he, that is Satan, is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now we understand that uh, the Satan, that the the demons are, are disobedient, but we also see that he is speaking about mankind. Second Timothy two thirteen says that while evil people and impostors go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, if their father is Satan and there's no truth in him, and he is the father of lies then those who are ensnared by his power will do likewise. Does that make sense? This isn't a very pretty picture. If you want to turn to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. I sound a little somber right now, and I'm not usually this sedated. But when it comes to looking at the desperate condition of mankind, it it breaks my heart. Because there is no rescue of ourselves from ourselves. Paul tells Timothy, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Can we say that that, that fits our nation right now? In the, the, uh, we are a society of selfies. We now have phones designed specifically for taking pictures of yourself. We have Facebook. And whose face is on that book? Other people's face? No, it's your face. We have Twitter which is merely a way that you can tweet your every thought so that everybody can hear what you're thinking right now. It's all about me. My thoughts, my face, my interests, my desire. Look at me, look at me, look at me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm important. And the greatest offense in our society right now is that you should dare to unfriend someone. We laugh, but it's true. We are lovers of self. Self Self-help, self-improvement, self-forgiveness is a major teaching I hear now. You've got to forgive yourself. You've got to love yourself. You can't respect others until you respect you. You can't love others until you love you. You You're having problems in the world because you don't love you enough. You need to take care of you, and once you take care of you, then you can take care of other people. You got to do right by you, and then you can do right by others. Can you ever love yourself enough, or do you always need more? Can you ever do right well by yourself enough without costing somebody else? We are obsessed with ourselves. Lovers of money. I think that goes without saying. Proud. Do you know that one of the, the sins that, that God talks about as being disgusting before him is the sin of pride? It's a big deal to him. He associates it with witchcraft, a killing offense under the law. The scripture shows that Satan committed the sin of pride, saying that by my hand I'll lift myself up above the Most High. But when you say that somebody is proud, that's not really a big deal in our society. Oh, he's just proud. It's tolerable, sometimes even admirable, as far as our, our society goes. 
arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. And that's something I think is, is becoming very true about our nation right now. Unappeasable, unsatisfiable. We are looking more and more, I believe, at a culture of offense. I am offended with you. And to, be, to offend somebody is a sin greater than any other now. You offended me. Slanderous, without self-control. Brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I heard somebody say not too long ago, the world's heard enough about sin and the world's heard enough about the fallen nature of man. They just need to know that they can feel good. If you don't know you're broken, if you don't know you're sick, why would you ever go see the doctor? If you don't know that you're in desperate need of a savior, why would you ever want one? Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. We are, avoid, we are told to avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households, capture weak-willed women, bonded, uh, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Boy, isn't that true? Knowledge increases, but wisdom, where can it be found? We know so much about the particulars, but we don't know how they, we we're supposed to live among them and do what to do with them. And that is the condition of man. That is who we once were if we have come to Christ. And if we have not come to him, that is what we are enslaved to. And that is what we see in our, our world, the world over. From bad to worse, where truth is harder and harder to find. We are now at a point in our culture where we don't even know what a man and a woman is anymore. What follows? What is a child? What is a family? Should we even bother using that language? What does it mean anymore? What follows after that? Who am I? Who are you? Why should I care about me and why should I care about you? It gets worse and it gets worse. Let's take a look at the individual. Here in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. This is who, again, as I said, this is who we are apart from Christ. We lived it, we walked it, we wanted it. As much as we hated what we saw, we, we, would, we refused to be separated from it. He says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, our nature, that is to the very core of who a person is, their very identity, out of which flows every desire, every action, every thought, that is speaking of the nature of you and I, children of wrath. not having just deserved God's wrath for our sins, but we eagerly desired to do it for that is what was natural to us. Maslow, 
I, I speak of him simply because, one, I can pronounce his name, and two, uh, he is perhaps the most well-known humanist philosopher. Uh, if you have had anything to do with um, sociology, with psychology, with human resources, if you have, if you have any, taken any training or any classes in working with other people and within uh, man's understanding of the desires of man, Maslow is the man you would probably have studied. We've all heard of, very likely have all heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a, it's a triangle with all of the, quote, needs of man from uh, sexual satisfaction to food to uh, all the way at the very top, self-actualization. And Maslow said this is the hierarchy of man's needs, and if all of these are met, man will be happy, fulfilled, and successful. And what is not said is Maslow's own statement concerning who and what man is. Maslow is a man who fell in the territory of what's called humanism. That is, he believed evolution, but he was not an evolutionist. That is, he did not pursue Darwinian evolution. He merely took the concept and ran with it. Since man, there is no God, and man is a creature who has arisen from, his, from the natural process of the world, everything about man is natural. Since there is no supernatural, there can be nothing wrong with man. And if, this, if the desires within a man are occurring naturally, fulfillment of them must then automatically produce fulfillment of the needs and desires of the person. That is, he's only looking to the desires of the body. Make sense? And of him, he, and of man, Maslow said, man is basically good and self-perfectible. He has within himself, because he is basically good and, and has risen from natural processes, he can perfect himself by his own effort. And there is nothing, he said, that is evil naturally about a man. Now you might ask, well, where did evil come from? He was posed with that question, where then does evil come from? And since he has now already said that man is basically good, and evil is not part of his nature, where does evil come from? Why is there evil in the world? Maslow took a page out of Rousseau's book. Rousseau was a French philosopher many generations before, and Rousseau was far more honest than Maslow was. And Maslow, in agreement with Rousseau, stated this, sick societies make sick people. So he said, evil, the heart of evil, the root of evil, is not in man, but in the societies that man is part of. I remember being asked in high school, as we studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I made the statement, well, wait a minute, if man is basically good and societies and societal structures are made by man, where does the evil in these structures come from if they are made up of basically good people? Maslow beats around the bush. Rousseau gets straight to the point. Rousseau says it is religion specifically the Christian religion, for the Christian religion says there is sin. Therefore, evil entered the world because Christianity says it exists. And if man divorces himself from this, he will be good. That was Rousseau. Maslow discounted it entirely, stepping around it, said that man in his natural state pursuing his desires will be good. And yet we have seen nothing but rape, murder, and destruction when man is left to run unchecked. Where does the evil come from when a, a young man walks into a theater and guns down everybody watching a movie? From the society he's in? You could probably blame some of it there. But if society is made by men, where does the evil in society come from? It must come from the men. Mankind, I mean. the passions of the body. Jesus says in Mark 7.22, from within, out of the heart of man, 
This is Jesus speaking about the heart of mankind. That is the nature. From the heart, that is the deepest core, the very fiber of who you are. From the heart comes your intents and your desires. The mind is the checkpoint where we decide whether or not we will act on them and how we will act on them. But the heart is this deep desire of man. And Jesus says, from the heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, uh, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things from within, and they defile a person. Why is there evil in the world? Because men are evil. Why am why are you and I evil? Because our hearts are desperately sick and broken. And we have the strangest idea that if I go to another man who is desperately sick and broken, he can make me better. It doesn't make sense. I can tell you of Timothy, we already covered that, the fall of man. The Holy Spirit through Paul tells us in Galatians 5.17 that the desires of the flesh, the body, the desires of the fallen mind, is contrary to the desires of the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit. They are in opposition to each other. And if you want proof of that, you can look in the Scripture and whatever God says is true. Pick the opposite and our culture will probably call it true. The desire will be to do the opposite of it. What God says shall not be separated. A man and woman comes together, become one flesh. God says let no man separate. What do we do? We promote divorce. When God says uh, shall not come together, a man shall not lie with a woman, with a, a man as a man lies with a woman. What does the culture say? Let's bring it together. Where God says there are roles, man says envy. I will not do that. Where God says there are uh, structures in place, man says none. Where God says boundaries, man says freedom. Where God says life is found here, man says there's nothing there to find. So is it any surprise that we find our society going from bad to worse? Because the heart is bad and the desires are bad. In fact, even the mind itself is bad and warped. Turn to Ephesians 4, 17. Paul has continued, and here he is he's calling on the believers. He says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now he doesn't mean, you know, in the you know, how you, your gait when you're walking. I've, I've had to do that battle before. He's talking about how you live, to live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. The futility of minds. The effort, the work of the thoughts of man produce nothing in keeping with the character and thoughts of God. The great learning of man cannot accomplish the thoughts of God. The philosophies, the thoughts, the structures man makes are not simply in, uh, uh, unable, they are incapable. And by the great effort we put into it, still does not produce the work of God. A man with great effort can change an area of his life. With great effort, a drunkard can put down his drink. But the nature and desire of his heart has not been changed, and it comes out in other ways. I work with inmates, and they understand this very well because they are living in the middle of it. Addictions for one man having with great effort through great learning in, in various programs he's gone through has been trained how to not do certain behaviors and yet the desire for his addiction comes out in other areas. So although he has corrected one action, the root of the problem 
is not resolved. I use another example. Uh, I have arrow weeds in my yard. And if you guys have done, had to fight, battle with arrow weeds, you know my plight. You cannot get rid of those darn things. They just keep coming right back up again. You can pull out a root this long, and it's not easy, and it will still come back up again. I put a paver on top of one of them. I was so frustrated. I went, boom, and with great weight and mass, I've crushed that, that arrowweed down. Do you know what happened? It goes out and pops up five feet over, and I got this big old thing down there. I didn't take care of the problem. I just moved it. And the great learning of man can move the problems of man around so that you can appear outwardly. My, my, my lawn looks great in that spot, but the root of the problem is not dealt with. I have only moved my problem somewhere else. And the great learning of man allows him to, with great effort, pat yourself on the back, you did a good job, to change one area, but the rot comes out somewhere else. trying to run around, sticking your fingers in the, the holes of a leaking ship, and yet there's still more and more holes. The thought, the mind of, of, the, of the fallen man is futile in its thoughts. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. Now, we have some very brilliant men and women in our world keen uh, scientists, observers of how the world work, and they are not darkened in their understanding of how things work. We're talking about their understanding, not of the particulars, which science gives us an understanding of the particulars, how something works, why it works, but cannot answer the question of what is it there for? What do I do with this? What does it mean? Where did it come from? Where is it going? Science cannot answer those questions. And this understanding is speaking of the understanding of the mind and thoughts of God. The mind is futile in understanding God, and even more, it is dark in its understanding of God, and not just dark, but getting darker, just as we looked briefly at Cain and Abel. The darkness in Cain's heart he passed on to his children, withholding from them the instruction Cain had. And they then withholding and withholding and withholding before you know it. What was once plain to them is now hidden to them, not because God has hidden it, but because they have hidden it from themselves. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. And why is man ignorant to God? because of the hardness in their hearts. Our hearts are hard to God, not sensitive to Him, not willing to recognize what He has plainly put before us. And when what is plainly put before us shouts and screams in our face of the glories and incredible uh, mercies of God, we turn our eyes away and give credit to something else. I mentioned Provine, and one of his colleagues had, in a textbook, uh, demanded his students, when you look in the microscope, and when you look into the depths of the mysteries of the cell, and you see how the cell operates, and we peer where Darwin could not see, and we see the incredible workings, the machinery deep within uh, the, the, the cell, and the incredible detail and precision do not let yourselves think that this was designed. You must continually remind yourself this was an accidental creation by purposeless and meaningless forces. Because the mind is dark, the thoughts are futile, and the heart is hard to the song of the Creator right there in front of them as they look in the microscope and they see the incredible wonders of the work of God laid out before them and the, the chorus sounds so loud and so sweet, but because of the hardness of heart, we look upon the very mysteries of God and say, wow, what an accident, and we carry on. They have become callous 
and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. It is not enough that, that a fallen man sins, a fallen man wants to sin and is eager to find new sins by which he may sin. And that is the condition of man. There is no rising up out of that. It would be like standing in a bucket grabbing hold of the handles and with every strength that you have in your body trying to lift yourself up off the ground. I will lift myself up. And what do you do? You just stand there and you work and you fret and you fuss and you, you fume and you sweat and you get nowhere. Although in your mind and in the mind of man we think because of our great efforts we must have accomplished something. And because we have stressed harder and worked harder and put, shown ourselves more, more better than others, we think ourselves having accomplished something. And yet before God, who is holy and sees all things as, as, as they are, we have gotten nowhere. In fact, we have gotten ourselves in a much worse predicament. Man left to himself, as we see in Scripture, gets worse and worse. And who, how can he save himself? Not only does, has he earned his place in hell, but he eagerly runs for it. It is not enough for us to have a, uh, a rundown room in hell. No, we want a penthouse suite in the deepest recesses of the darkest places. And I'm glad that here is a point where I can change in tone. Because into this funeral march that we've been looking at, we have a beautiful word, but. Verse 4 says, but God, in the face of the fall of man, in the face of the desperate wickedness in the hearts of each and every one of us, proved by the desperate wickedness in our culture, in our falling world, enslaved to a desperately wicked, uh, wicked and sick creature but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even while we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ but God interrupted God has to interrupt because I cannot interrupt myself, and you're not going to interrupt me. The world won't interrupt me. Satan won't interrupt me. No one's going to stop me from destroying myself. And nobody can point out the truth because nobody can see the truth. But God interrupted. Grace interrupted me. Grace interrupts into the lives of men. And God puts the pause button, just as he did in the flood. He does so in the lives of those who will pause, whom he pauses. God interrupts. But God, being rich in mercy, rich in mercy. The character of God in opposition to the character of man. We just look how horrible man is and how horrible he is becoming. But God, in his mercy. Ephesians, or sorry, uh, Galatians, Romans, somewhere in there. Romans 8.28. Much of these notes I finished up at 2.45 in the morning, so I might have a couple numbers backwards. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The plan of God interrupting, the grace of God interrupting. His holiness demands that he must bring justice. And our condition demands the severest justice of God. For we are not simply content to sin ourselves, but we desire others to join us in our sin. And a little bit's not enough. We want as much as we can get. Fill the cup and let it run over and pass it around. 
But God interrupts. And what he begins, he will finish. He has promised to do so. And in Galatians 4.4, 4, we are told that when the fullness of time had come, the plan of God to interrupt all along, into the world, into our lives, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. God interrupting our descent into desperate darkness interrupted by the grace of God finding us where we are, but not content with just that. God doesn't leave us where he finds us, but carries us in his arms to heights we cannot even comprehend. While we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, while we were haters of righteousness, while we were doers of evil, inventors of, of, of sin, Christ died for us. Because of the great love with which he loved us. We understand all have sinned. And Christ, God has made us alive in Christ. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. And he says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. God interrupting by grace. Taking the death that we were due by our own actions, the penalty, the payment, and taking that death upon himself at the cross. So that he might make him who was no sin for us be sin so that we might have the righteousness of God. That does not mean that Jesus became sinful. No, consider this. If the righteousness of God is placed in that spot of sin that you and I hold, Christ takes the punishment for us and we are counted righteous, not because we are, but because he is. We didn't earn that. We didn't deserve that. The only earnings that we had gotten was death and hell. The righteous payment for our departure from truth. And, but this amazing grace of God tran should transform who we are. In fact, it does transform who we are. We are told we are saved by grace. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 tells us, In Him, that is Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of His grace. And how, great, how much grace does Christ have? Limitless. We are told that we are seated with Him, that is Christ, in heavenly places so that in the coming ages we might, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God is not content just to restore us to where we had once been, where man had fallen from, God not simply restore, but he elevated even higher to be made from a servant to a son, to a daughter of God. To be seated on the throne with him in Christ as a child sits on the lap of his father. That's an intimate relationship that a servant does not enjoy. And we might show his immeasurable grace and mercy to his glorious praise.
since we're nearly out of time, I'll go ahead and wrap up. On the second portion of Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 20 through 24. This interruption of God into our lives. We can interrupt, we can in, enter into that interruption through Christ. We are told that by faith we are saved in Christ. Jesus says that all who believe in me will receive eternal life. And that life is made available, he, he said, when he was going to go to the cross, and he has. He has paid the penalty for our sin. He has opened the way where there was no way. He said he is the door. He has opened through himself passage from death to life. He has interrupted by his grace the death spiral of mankind. And he calls those who are his interrupting our lives. And the result is the work of God in the, in the lives of those who belong to Him. How can you know you belong to Him? Because we begin to look like Him. We look in Ephesians here, verse 21, But assuming you have heard about Him and were taught Him, that is Christ, by the way, he'd made the, the, the declaration prior to this, that no one comes to know Christ through the work of the world and through the way of the world. That makes sense. If the world is separated from God, if the hearts of men are separated from God, he cannot draw near God by his own effort. But God interrupts. And we are taught in Christ by the word of God. We're told that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God has to interrupt. We are told to put off our old self, that is, our old manner of living. The way that we learn to think and speak and to live prior to Christ. Because we were educated in how to live and how to think and how to speak in a world and by a heart that is separated from God. And so that lifestyle is from those who are dying to those who are dying and leads all men to death. And so we're told you must put it off. Why? Because you have learned habits, ways of living, ways of speaking that do not lead you to God and are not appro appropriate for those who are now alive in Christ. Becoming like little children all over again, learning how to speak and walk all over again. being taught anew. To put off the old self, the old manner of living, which belongs to your former manner of life, which belongs or, uh, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, through lying desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Remember we said, we looked there briefly prior that the mind was bad. The mind has to be renewed and is renewed through, through the word of God. And to put on the new self or the new habits, that is the, the behaviors, because we have a new nature in Christ. And so we have new desires. But if we take those new desires and we impair them with the old manner of living, there will be ruin. As Jesus put previously, putting new wine in old wine skins. The old skins burst. The old life cannot hold the new life you've been given in Christ. And to put on the new self, the new behaviors, the new way of living, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not that our faith saves us because he goes on to say uh, that it is a gift of God. God interrupts. He gives the grace. He gives the faith. 
sealing us for himself, not as a result of works that no one may boast. No one, no one can take credit for the work of God. It is the work of God, which is why it is so perfect. Which means we can trust him to make sense of this world, to make sense of us, to put back into order everything that has come out of disorder, to even make us aware of where disorder is, because right now we can't even see what is out of order. Thinking good is evil, and evil is good. For we are his workmanship. We are the, sub, we are the, sub, the ones subject to the working of his hands, like the clay in the hands of the potter yields to the will of the potter. And what is worked out in our lives through Christ is not for any one of us to boast in and to say, you know, look at me how well I have done. Because it is not us. It is his hands who are shaping and working in us his will. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So our lives should show a, different, a, a difference, a change. And the darker the world gets, the more different we ought to look. And as the days pass, the more different we ought to be from who we were prior to Christ, who we are now in Christ. And as Paul is making this point, because he says, and you were dead, and you are dead no longer. You were this way, and you're this way no longer. You once walked in a world dead to God, lost in its mindlessness and its hardness to God, but you live that way no longer. We should not look like our culture. In fact, we become relevant as believers in Jesus Christ to a world that is lost and dying, not because we look like the world or, that, or because we are familiar to the world, but because we are absolutely different than the world. That is when we are relevant. that our lives individually and corporately are transformed by the work of God to the good works he has prepared, not the ones that we think are right to do, the ones that he has set ahead of us. And they are, we do not have to guess because he's made them clear for us. Because he says that these are what God has prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And those good works he's prepared beforehand is that life in Christ that putting off of the old and putting on of the new that shows a complete transformation. I am not simply putting paving stones on, stop, on top of weeds that pop up elsewhere. No, the weeds and the roots are entirely and utterly removed from my life by the work of God as I submit to his instruction. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. My words are weak because I'm a man. But your words are always strong. And in my weakness, your strength always shines. Father, I ask that your, your words be the only ones that anyone here remembers. Let each of us uh, be forgotten, but your will and your word reign forever. Teach us the meaning of these words today and tomorrow. May we in our lives this week as we go out from here. Put into practice what we have learned. Be challenged by the great hope that you have given us in your word through Christ. We ask, Father, I ask, I ask that we would be ones who bring glory to your name through how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would all 